It's Ken Harbaugh with the Midas Touch Network. It has been an unbelievable week for American politics between the assassination attempt, the unhinged Republican National Convention, and now the shakeup of the Democratic ticket. My emotions, like yours, I expect, have been all over the map. You've probably seen that if you've been watching my regular Against All Enemies episodes. But it really does feel like a new day for Democrats. There is a palpable energy and optimism about where we are headed. And this week, I'm posting an interview with someone who personifies that optimism, not just about where the Democratic Party is headed, but where our country is headed. I talk to a lot of political leaders on this show, many of them I consider my friends, but Andy Kim is the best of the best. Integrity and humility define everything about him, and he is on track with a little help to become New Jersey's next Democratic senator. His primary win surprised a lot of people, not me. Andy's win truly is a case of the good guy coming in first. He and I recorded this before the assassination attempt on former President Trump, but Andy's observations about the state of our politics hold up. He also has a lot to say about how to fix it. One more thing before we jump into the interview. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do. It's at team underscore Harbaugh, and it has bonus content and the full Burn the Boats and Against All Enemies archive. We're trying to grow the channel, so every subscription helps. Thanks. Here's me and New Jersey's next U.S. Senator, Andy Kim. My guest today is an old friend, Andy Kim, who represents New Jersey's third congressional district, and recently won the Democratic nomination for that state's Senate seat. He's also one of only seven Democrats who won their House elections in districts carried by Trump. We got a lot to learn from Andy today. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ken. Uh, so be honest with us. Are you just running for the Senate because the House of Representatives has become the most awful workplace in America. You've got Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene as co-workers. That has to be getting really old by now. Yeah, I mean, look, we have the most extreme Speaker of the House uh, probably in American history. But I have to say, it's not like the Senate is the most well-oiled machine. Um, you know, still some challenges there in terms of personality. So, look, um, you know, my first boss at the State Department when I started working there, he had this line. He said, you don't have good government unless you have good people working in government. And, you know, I still believe in that. And, I'm, you know, I've heard some of my House colleagues, um, the ones that, yeah, that drive me crazy, but I've heard them basically say out loud that, you know, their plan is to try to make politics so toxic that, you know, regular, thoughtful reasonable people don't want to participate in it. You know, the main thing is, you know, you can't see the ground. You can't let them take over. So it's important to be able to, um, you know, to have public servants there. I think that sentiment applies broadly, not seeding the ground. I mean, I, I, I respect you and the folks we ran alongside in 2018 enormously for, for sticking it out. Um, but that same sentiment, it applies to why I have the flag behind me. We can't give these things up. We can't let them have it or they will take it and destroy it as they are trying to do with patriotism, as they are trying to do with democracy. You just described Speaker Johnson as the most extreme speaker in the history of the country. But I've also heard you say that he's basically a co-speaker with Hakeem Jeffries. He can't do anything without your help. Can you explain that dynamic? Yeah, well, you know, just just uh, just on that first point, you know, I, I've been saying this a lot lately, you know, be, a lot of people, they see the craziness in the House and it, you know, it turns them off from politics. It makes them not want to engage. Um, but I've been saying this line a lot lately where I say, I believe the opposite of democracy is apathy. Um, and it's so important to fight against that sense of helplessness. So, you know, when you see the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Speaker Johnsons, and you're like, I don't want anything to do with this. You know, you have to just remember that just gives them more space to run. And, you know, it's important for us to be able to push back. But look, you know, the dynamics are such that, um, you know, we have a, an unbelievably narrow majority in uh, the House of Representatives for the Republicans. And they have, you know, they've just shown that they're incapable of governing. You know, the governing is not something that they're able to do just given their dynamics. I mean, and this is the problem, right? Like you have, you have people there in that Congress 
in that caucus on the Republican side that are more interested in being social influencers online rather than lawmakers. They don't actually want to govern. What they want to do is try to make a point, try to boost their own ego, their ambition. So, you know, that's, you know, that's what we're dealing with. Um, and so, you know, if we do need to get things done, like, uh, you know, just, I mean, look what happened with the, the defense authorization, Act, you know, something that normally is a very bipartisan bill, but they just turned it into a political weapon. You know, something that was, uh, you know, just you know, f- falls so short of, of what our service members and our national security deserve. So it's, it's a challenge and it's very frustrating. And look, there's no, no, uh, no beating around the bush of like, you know, this is added to the reason why a lot of my colleagues are retiring, don't want to have anything to do with this. But we, again, we have to be very careful not to do this in a way that gives them more power. You, you said that the Republican caucus is incapable of governing. But, well, you also said that there are some who don't want to govern. That seems to be the the driving motivation. Like, chaos is the point. It's not that they, they can't get their act together. They don't want to. The chaos serves them. The appearance of dysfunction of a federal government that doesn't work actually emboldens their their ideological approach to the to the Republican project these days. Yeah. And like, you know, I, I, I'd even say I'd even caution and calling it ideological because it's just reactionary. You know, they just want to shut it down. You know, like I don't yeah. really think that there's some grand, you know, strategy behind it. It's just that like we live in a time like I work in what's arguably the most reactionary building in America. You know, people are just reacting to whatever is in the headlines and whatever vote is ahead of us. And so it it just becomes this sort of scenario where people just, you know, they just want to be opposed to things like, you know, then this was a challenge, you know, like last year when the debt ceiling crisis was happening. It's incredibly difficult. You know, people are like, you know, people are like, oh, are are you going to negotiate and avoid the debt ceiling uh, from uh, from from collapsing in under us? And, you know, it's challenging because like some of the people that are in Congress, like they want us to default on our debt. They want our government to shut down. Like it's hard to negotiate to avoid a government shutdown when people are like, that they're, that's what they want. You know, they want to bring it to a grinding halt. They want to create a circus, a show. They want to be able to flex their muscles to show that they are powerful enough to bring down the Speaker of the House like Matt Gates was or, you know, or the bring, you know, shut down the government. You know, that's how they view their strength. You know, Matt Gates has his line. He says something to the effect of like, you know, if you're not on the news, you're not governing. It's like, it's something to that effect. And I just, I just find that to be like so indicative of what's wrong with our politics right now. It, it equates the idea of attention, like governance is attention rather than impact. So like you can see how someone with that mindset how they're incentivized to, cra- to say crazy things, right? Because if it's about attention, well, you can get attention by shutting down the government or saying crazy incendiary things on the House floor or whatnot. And so our reward system is broken. Like I- I've often thought like if Congress is game, if you gamify Congress, like what's the, what are the point systems? How do you advance? It's like fundraising, social media, like likes and followers and, you know, where in that gamification point system is legislation? You know, where is, you know, doing oversight over the executive branch and these other duties? And it just it's become so far from what we deserve. I don't think most voters realize, even the ones who support those firebrands, the performative politicians, just how much they depend on the system ultimately delivering for them. I'm looking at Lauren Boebert's ribbon cuttings in Colorado, taking credit for all of these infrastructure projects that she voted against. And our friend Jason Crow has been great at calling her out for that. But you have that repeated in district after district after district where the, the Matt Gates and the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Lauren Boeberts of the world engage in this kind of performative politics, but then take credit when things actually get done that they had nothing to do with. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really, it's really something. I'm um, just kind of the shamelessness with which, you know, people approach this work. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's something that like, I think is, you know, like people have asked me, like, do they really believe what they're saying? 
You know, like I get that question a lot. Like, do you know, do these people really believe what they're saying? And, you know, it's interesting about six, you know, six years ago when I first came into Congress, I would say like, look, they were, you know, I, I kind of categorize the Republicans. There's the, you know, there's the kind of traditional conservatives of which there are very few of them left. Um, then there are the crazies and you can, you know, fill in the blank, whatever name comes to mind. Um, and then there's like the cowards, right? People who know better. <laughs> Um, but they, they, they don't do it because they're looking out for themselves, you know, kind of the Kevin McCarthy's and others, but like, the, unfortunately there are a lot more of the crazies than there were even just six years ago. Um, you know, a lot of these people, I mean, I saw it on January 6th, I saw it, you know, after the ride and they're giving these speeches about the stolen election. Like uh, either they're just amazing actors or they really do believe it. And it just, it's, it's scary. You know, it's, it's really scary. I, you know, I saw them, you know, I was, you know, maybe maybe 20 feet away from Marjorie Hill agreed and a couple other Republicans um, at the exact moment that the Dobbs decision came out, we were on the house floor and, you know, they were just high-fiving each other, you know, hugging each other, you know, just celebrate and say like, they never thought the day would ever come. I mean, it was, it was, it was really shocking. Uh, and it's really sad, you know, it's just really disturbing to see that kind of celebration of the restriction of rights of Americans while we're standing on, you know, the sacred ground of the house chamber. So it's, it's, these are, these are, these are scary times. There is a picture of you from January 6th that went viral. Uh, and I think it spoke to a lot of people about what we need to do as a country in the aftermath. You were cleaning up after the rioters desecrated our nation's capital. I'm wondering if any of your Republican colleagues spoke to you about that photo, if you have conversations with them about the significance of, of January 6th, or is that the kind of thing that, that they just force themselves to forget about? Yeah, um, I, I I can't really recall any like really in depth conversations at all. I mean, like you know, there was the day of, and I remember being in the House chamber immediately after they reopened the, the Capitol after the rioters had been the riot had been quelled. I remember hearing Kevin McCarthy speak. He was the first Republican to speak on the House floor after uh, after the riot. And he said, like, something to the effect of, like, this is the worst day that I've ever had, you know, in this job, like, in, in public service. And so, and like, <laughs> you know, obviously, he very, very quickly forgot that he said those words and, and, and very much changed his tune and just said, we need to, you know, turn the page of America, I think is how he framed it. But I just said, like, look, you can't turn the page of American history until you write the page of American history. Like, we need to, like document what happened before you turn the page. Uh, and so it just, you know, it, it drives me crazy. What, what we often get, and this is what happens in just politics very large these days, is if you, if you engage on something that is difficult, like January 6th, oftentimes the, re the Republicans I talk to, they'll just, they'll just um, deflect it, right? And they'll talk about, oh, well, like, you know, Democrats complained when this and this happened or that and that happened. You know, it's, it, it, they don't actually confront this. You know, I feel like we should all just universally be able to say like what happened on January 6th should not happen in our country, it should not happen in a democracy. As someone and, you know, yourself, you, you know, you, you and I served uh, in, in, you know, in, in some of the same countries and in difficult parts around the world. Like, whether or not you have the peaceful transfer of power is pretty much the defining characteristic of a mature democracy. And like we failed that on January 6th, you know, and that's, that should be very alarming to us about the state of our country and the fragility of our democracy. But just, you know, the unwillingness for them to, to say anything, I think speaks unfortunately a lot about just the moment that we're in and the cowardice that is around us. Well, the one person we haven't mentioned so far, you just brought up the word cowardice, is Donald Trump. And I feel like what you're really saying is that they are afraid that the the leader of the Republican Party, who has a massive uh, following prone to violence, as was demonstrated on January 6th, might come down on them. That's the cowardice we're talking about, 
right? We're talking about a party that is now in the thrall of a cult leader prone to violence. Uh, yeah, I mean, like it may not necessarily be Donald Trump that they're war- they're scared of directly, but just like the the atmosphere that has been created, or and then the backlash from you know the MAGA uh, yeah. you know MAGA population and others, just just you know, I mean, just I mean, like I, I, it breaks my heart, like those Republicans that voted to impeach Trump and like the death threats that they got, you know, and just like the the violence within our politics, whether it's physical violence, like January 6th, you know, and I, I sat down recently with the family of, of, you know, officer Sicknick, who, you know, was, is from here in New Jersey and, and, you know, is, 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 uh, you know, something that we, you know, someone that we lift up to remember just how devastating that day was. Or like to the, you know, the, the verbal uh, threats and, and, and to, members of Congress's family, his and others. I mean, just, it's, it's crazy. You know, it's, it's scary times. So yeah, I just like, I think that that's what I worry about right now. It's like, I, I, I see the democracy that is so easily manipulated by disinformation, by threats, by violence, by, you know, a tribalism and a binariness that prevents and restricts genuine you know freedom of expression and thoughts and and debate and it's scary i mean i got a six-year-old and an eight-year-old i got a first grader and a third grader that are, you know in their final days of, of of school right now here in jersey and like i i worry about what kind of america they're gonna grow up in you know this is this is not the kind of you know deliberative democracy that my that inspired my family my parents 50 years ago to travel halfway around the world to be able to start a family. And so, you know, I I think it's just one of those things we have to make sure we don't just take it for granted and assume that, uh, you know, that it'll always be as as strong of a country as we would like it to be. Um, And, you know, I I do think that that's, you know, Trump is definitely instigating a lot of this, but, you know, it, it, he cannot thrive uh, unless there is this deficiency within our our society, this kind of unraveling that is there. The way I sort of describe it as being a dis, you know a Democrat that won a district Trump won, is there such distrust in government here? And uh, you know, like oftentimes people think, oh, battleground district, it's like a blue army and a red army duking it out every day. But honestly, it's the vast majority of people in my congressional district can't stand either party right now. And that's what gives Trump space. You know, if there are, you know, that's why I'm so focused on this mission of how to try to restore trust and integrity back into our politics, because I think that's what takes the oxygen away from Donald Trump, which takes away from the, you know, like the, 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 the fertile ground on which he's able to, to grow this, uh, you know, this, this very scary, um, uh, you know, devastation upon our democracy here, but it's, it's going to be a diff, it's going to be a challenge. And, you know, we see it here in New Jersey, 84% of people in my home state of New Jersey believe that their politicians are corrupt. You know, you can see why that's ground where, you know, Trump and others can, can, can get their roots into and that's what that's that's something that we need to really fix. Hi everyone, it's Ken Harbaugh, and I need to take a short break here to ask all of you watching and listening for a quick favor. I am starting my own YouTube channel at team underscore Harbaugh, where I'll be posting videos regularly, including bonus content. It's a great place to find both Burn the Boats and Against All Enemies episodes, including the full archive. That's going to take a while to upload, but it's all going to live there. I could really use your help growing the channel. Please consider subscribing today. The link is in the show notes. Or just search for team underscore Harbaugh on YouTube. I really appreciate the support. Everything we do here depends on you. Thanks so much. We all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste time stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Z-Biotics is the answer we've all been looking for. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. 
Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best the next day. The first time I tried Zbiotics was at a recent family gathering. As instructed, I drank a bottle of Zbiotics before any alcohol. I was amazed at how good I felt the next day. Every time I have a Zbiotics before drinking, it makes such a difference the next day. Even after drinks the night before, I know I'll be able to get back to my daily routine, like working out or mowing the lawn with ease. Give Zbiotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com/boats to get 15% off your first order when you use boats at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee, so if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash boats and use the code boats at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode. Lumen is the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. And on the app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workout, sleep, and even stress management. Here's how it works. All you have to do is breathe into your lumen first thing in the morning, and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism, whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. Then lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals, so you know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. And lumen will give you tips to keep you on top of your health game. Metabolic health is one of the keys to overall well-being. Your metabolism is your body's engine. It's how your body turns the food you eat into fuel that keeps you going. Because your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, better sleep, etc. Lumen gives you recommendations to improve your metabolic health. So, if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me slash boats to get 15% off your lumen. That's l-u-m-e-n dot m-e slash boats for 15% off your purchase. Thank you, Lumen, for sponsoring this episode. Let's talk about corruption in in politics for a second, because I, I want to get specific. There, There's obviously corruption on both sides, but I think there is a material difference in how a responsible party handles that kind of corruption versus how a, a co-opted irresponsible party handles it. And let's just talk about New Jersey for a second. You've got a couple of major cases, uh, Menendez, and, and who's the other one? Is it Norcross? Um, yeah. George, George Norcross. Just, from, just the other day, yeah. Yeah, and, and, <clears throat> and I think it is a testament, even though they are both – Democrats or Menendez was, it is a testament to the the maturity and responsibility of the, the Democratic Party um, when you look at how they have handled the corruption in the ranks. Can you describe what's happening and, and then we can riff on how, how, the, yeah. how the Republican Party handles corruption? It elevates it. But what is the state of that in New Jersey right now? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, it's... You're right. My, my senior senator, you know, he was indicted last year um, and just, you know, I, I think that indictment really, you know, really captured the attention of the country because they, you know, involved gold bars in foreign countries. And, um, you know, that's something that's the kind of stuff that really builds into this sense of distrust. But like, look, I, I wanted to show that, you know, that myself, that I don't stand for that, that you know, I hope my party doesn't stand for that. And you know, I stepped up to run against him. The next day, I was not planned to run for Senate. This was not in the cards. As I told you, I'm a young father, young kids. I got my hands full. Statewide race was not what I was uh, in, in, in my, my card deck for 2024. But I felt compelled to step up and you know, to try to show people that like, I'm going to give the people of New Jersey a choice. And that you know, when we see allegations of corruption and, and challenges there, like we want to... Uh, make sure that accountability is there. And that's just, you know, I hope people see that as a stark difference to what's happening 
uh, you know, with Donald Trump right now or happening with the Republican Party right now where they're celebrating and lifting up and protecting, uh, you know, those that are, are accused or convicted of, of corruption in different ways. And, and that's just, you know, that's, that's a difference. I mean, look, New Jersey has its problems. You know, the Democratic Party, you know, has its problems. And New Jersey, you know, around the country, like, you know, there, there are things we need to fix. And but I, I hope people see like that, that, that willingness to engage and, and fix like that's what we need to invest in. You know, I feel like a reform agenda is powerful, not just in New Jersey, but around the country. People are yearning. There's a hunger for a new generation of leadership to step up, but also for a different kind of politics and a politics that moves away from partisan knife fighting and tries to center itself more towards public service which is what, you know, people really ultimately want. So, you know, I think that that's, you know, going to be the, the challenge of our generation in politics is to try to see if we can pivot away from this tailspin that we've been in for the last, you know, couple of decades. And, you know, I, I just think we need a new, like, you know, Kennedy moment, a new, like, ask now what your country can do for you kind of moment. And just reinvigorate that sense of public service. And, you know, that's what I hope others believe in and hope we can try to build that. Well, I think your nomination, um, your winning the Democratic nomination for the Senate seat is a, a great sign of that kind of progress. Because it, it wasn't just Democratic leaders in New Jersey and across the country who said, we've got to root out the kind of corruption that Menendez represents. It was obviously, in the case of a Democratic primary race, a an expression of the popular will. New Jerseyans want you to represent them over an incredibly powerful, entrenched uh, Democrat who was stealing money. I mean, that's that's got to be an uplifting sign for you. Yeah, I mean, look, and my my primary ended up being a very dramatic primary. You know, it was. Uh, you know, and I'll be honest, you know, I was uh, uh, seen as a distant underdog when I first started this because, you know, New Jersey, we've had a problem with machine politics, with the politics that allows a handful of party leaders, party bosses to, you know, to basically have their way. And then, you know, we see that right now with the, you know, the latest indictment of, of, of Norcross. You know, these are, you know, longstanding challenges that we faced in New Jersey. Um, so, you know, a lot of people in Jersey politics said I was throwing away my career, that there's no way that I can win this primary here. But we really showed that, like, no, look, like people in New Jersey, they don't want to be told who to vote for. They want to make up their own mind that they want to be able to show that they're in the driver's seat of their democracy. And that wasn't happening before. And we're fixing that. We're changing. I sued. I filed a federal lawsuit to change our ballots, to make them more fair, to try to bring out permanent change, not just for my race, but for all elections going forward. So, you know, yes, it's, it's been a challenge. And, you know, yes, um, you know, there are things that we need to change and reform, even within the Democratic Party or the way that we operate. But, you know, that's what I hope people see is the energy is there. But again, you can't feel like it's just helpless. You can't be like, oh, like corruption is too endemic. There's no way we can change it. You got to be able to take these steps to put yourself in a place to be able to fix it. That's what we're trying to do in New Jersey. And it's created, you know, not just a campaign, but a movement, like a real grassroots movement for better democracy. It's inspiring. I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime here in New Jersey. What do your kids think? You've mentioned them a few times and they are the the stars of your your Twitter channel. Um uh, and, you know, I've talked to politicians who who take a very different approach, but they are they're part of your uh, I shouldn't say brand because that cheapens it. But, you know, they're part of you and uh, and you you talk about them in in your political races. Uh, and, yeah. and I'm just wondering <laughs> how much do they understand the stakes and what's going on? Yeah, you know, I. I you know, I, for a while, I didn't really talk about them or, or have them much on my social media. But I realized that, like, look, like, 
if someone asks me, why am I in politics? I never thought I'd be in politics. Like, this is not like, honestly, like I, I still to this day, like, I'm not really into politics. I'm not really into like this type of, of, of at least politics in its current form of just like knife fighting partisanship. But, um, but, you know, it's because I'm a dad, you know, I'm worried about what kind of America my kids are going to grow up in. And um, so like, People can't get to know me or understand my motivations without, you know, being able to understand my kids and my role. You know, my my eight-year-old and six-year-old, they're starting to, the older one is starting to understand what I do. Um, and, you know, that's been, that's been cool. My, my younger one, though, like, he's just like, he's fascinated. Like, you know, my neighbor across the street. Uh, his name's Matt, and like he has a he had a yard sign up with my name on it. And my younger son's like, why doesn't Matt have his name on his sign? Like, why does he have your name? Like, he clearly has no idea, <laughs> you know, what's going on in that way. But um, you know, I, I, I hope that they're taking away what this is about, which is again, it's about that sense of public service, or as my older kid Ty likes to talk about, it, just trying to help people. And so, um, you know, that's the hope, but it's, it's a challenge. I mean, you know, they were one year old and three year old when I came into Congress. Um, and it's hard, you know, I'm away from them a lot. And sometimes I worry I'm not being the kind of dad that they need, but I, I come to really believe, especially through the pandemic, I learned this, like, I think it's important to have the voices of young parents in Congress, in the house, in the Senate, in politics. Uh, to be able to, you know, talk about what it's like right now to deal and worrying about, you know, these issues in school or in, in, you know, any other aspect of their lives. And, you know, I hope to be able to bring that kind of perspective to the U.S. Senate where, you know, look, I mean, I'd be, I'd be, I, I come in as, as the fourth youngest senator in the country. I'd be the first Korean American ever, the first Asian American ever from the East Coast of America in the Senate. Um, from a lot of different perspectives, I think I can add an interesting voice. You have said that you have just as much of a right uh, as anyone else to represent New Jersey. And the subtext there is your Korean American heritage. How much has that shaped your, your messaging and your, your idea of representation? And how have the headwinds been? Because I know at state you experienced some pretty awful prejudice because of uh because of where your parents came from yeah i mean it's it's been a challenge you know i'm the son of immigrants uh, married to an immigrant and you know and you're right when i was at the state department you know I, I remember i came back from afghanistan and i was back in main state department and building in dc and i received a letter one day telling me that i've now been banned from working on issues related to korea because i'm korean american and that was, you know, that was really humiliating. You know, like I literally just served my country as a civilian embedded with the military in a war zone. Um, you know, I had top secret security clearance, like I've gone through it all. But, you know, it just, the way it, it made it feel like, is they were saying like, they don't know if I would be 100% loyal to this country, which made me feel like they're saying I'm not 100% American. And like, that was very hurtful. And I've, I've felt that at other phases. I mean, my congressional district, you know, it, it, when I first started, it was 85% white, less than 3% Asian that voted for Trump. And, you know, I had a lot of people tell me there's just no way this district's going to elect someone that looks like me to be their voice in Congress. And I had a lot of people tell me that, you know, there's just no chance. But, you know, this is where I grew up. <laughs> I did my whole K through 12 in the public schools here. So I, as you said, I want to say, I think I have every bit as much right to represent this district or my home state as anybody else. I'm as American as anybody else. Like my story is not just a Korean American story or an Asian American story. It's fundamentally an American story. So, you know, I, I my parents raised me a bit stubborn, so I've, I've, I've got to stay at it, but it's not easy. You know, my first race, they, they ran these ads, the Republicans ran these ads against me saying, you know, Andy Kim, he's not one of us. Now, I've heard that kind of stuff before, it hurts. Um, but you know, I've now had this district three times elect me to be their voice in Congress, even though the vast, 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 vast majority of people don't look like me. You now, if all goes long well November, I'll be again, the first Asian American elected to the U S Senate from the East coast of America. Cory Booker and I would be the first, well, we would be the only 
you know, all minority Senate de- delegation in the country, you know, showing that, you know, doesn't matter what you look like. It matters about what, you know, what you want to get done, the work you want to do in public service. So I, that's the kind of America I want to believe in. That's the kind of America I want to raise two Asian American little boys. And, and hopefully they'll grow up recognizing that, you know, anything's possible in the way that my mom and my dad wanted 50 years ago when they came here. So we're still, you know, writing the story and we're still trying to shape it. But, you know, I'm going to do my part. What's what's the state of the race? Because it's a pretty complicated field right now. It's not like many other Senate races. We've got a, a pretty clean matchup, although it's going to be a dirty fight here in Ohio. But what's going on in New Jersey? Yeah, no, like I said, I had a, a, a very dramatic primary. Um, and then now it's going into a dramatic general election. So um, I guess the, the, the biggest uh, element here is that Senator Menendez is in the race running as a third party independent candidate. Um, so, um, you know, that just adds a lot more complexity, you know, having the, the city senator still in the race, he has millions of dollars in the bank still, even though he's in the courtroom still. And we just don't know what that, what that's going to do to the race. We also have a very wealthy self-funding Republican. Uh, I have the great honor of being the only candidate in the country to run against four straight self-funders and four straight races. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, I've learned about it. It's not comfortable when people can spend millions of dollars of their own money. But, you know, look, I, I also get the sense right now that like, you know, Americans are tired of just a politics for the well-off and the well-connected. You know, they don't want to be, you know, with high, high rising prices in America, they don't want to be lectured to by a multimillionaire, you know, in terms of, you know, how they're going to fix this. They've heard that all before. And, you know, to have somebody here who is, a big supporter of the Dobbs decision that took away rights for women. You know, that's not the kind of person we keep representing New Jersey. So hopefully people will see through that. But, you know, there, there's concerns. We don't know what the Menendez dynamics going to do. We don't know how many votes he could potentially take away from me. Um, so we're going to run the strongest campaign possible, do everything we can to be able to mobilize. And, you know, I've been in tough races before against Republican self-funders. I know how to win. I just need the resources to do it. So, you know, that's what we're trying to build out right now. Well, we'll put a link in the show notes, maybe help you out a a little bit. Uh, I got to end with a super divisive, controversial question here. Um, Do you fall in the camp uh, of taking your Lego kits apart after you're done with them? Or do they do they sit on a shelf? And I'm going to put this uh, this tweet up here for context. Yeah, the Lego Millennium Falcon, I guess. In the, um, yeah, the, I am the, I, I, my basement now, it has uh, shelves filled with X Wings, Thai Bombers, the Millennium Falcon, and others. Uh, we had them up in our, our living room, but my wife said, you know, these got to go. But no, I, I, <laughs> I do let my kids play with them, though. I don't like get, I don't get so crazy that I, I don't let them touch them. But, I don't let them take it all apart after what you're, we put into it. Because I would, I would just never be able to, Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Andy, great as always catching up with you. Good luck in the race. Uh, link in the show notes. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, no, thanks so much. I appreciate it. It's great chatting with you. And yeah, those that want to help out, they can go to andykim.com. Thanks a lot, Ken. Love this video? Make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things Midas by signing up to the Midas Touch newsletter at MidasTouch.com newsletter.